this is Dr. Hena Asil and this is the answers and discussion of the answers for paper 1C of May 2018. Uh, this is in the Pearson Edexcel International uh, GCSE. So let's take a look at the questions and discuss the answers. The first question was chromatography can be used to separate the substances in a mixture. Diagram 1 shows the apparatus used to separate the different dyes in a food coloring. And uh, we're given a list of words in a box. And the question says, use the terms from the box to label diagram 1. Let's remind ourselves first, what is chromatography? We know that chromatography is a method of determining how many uh, constituents in a sample, how many substances are mixed in this sample, or to identify a sample to determine if it is there or not. Um, usually we put a spot of the sample uh, near the bottom of a rectangular filter paper. We uh, put the paper into a beaker containing a small amount of solvent and the solvent is allowed to move up the paper and as it moves up the paper the substances separate do you remember depending on what they separate depending on solubility in the solvent so the one that goes up a lot is very soluble in the solvent the one that goes only a little bit or does not go up at all uh, that means that it is not soluble in the solvent. So, from this diagram, what do we have? Well, that first box on the left, let's start with the box on the left. That is the baseline, which is a line drawn in pencil that uh, we draw on the paper to determine where the spot started from. And this is where we put the spot of the sample and we put the paper into a beaker containing a small amount of the solvent. Notice that the solvent does not go up to the baseline. It has to be below the baseline. And then on the right, we said we leave this until the solvent moves up the paper, the part where it moves up to the top of the paper, that is called the solvent front. And of course, this is a chromatography paper. Diagram two shows up chromatogram produced. So this is the chromatogram produced using four different food colorings P, Q, R, and S. Which food coloring contains only one dye? Of course, to determine which one contains only one dye, we're looking for the one that went up to give only one spot. So that is R. Which food coloring has colorings have one dye in common. One dye in common means all of them should have spots the same height. If the spots go up the same height, then they are the same dye. So obviously Q, R, and S have one dye in common. Explain which food coloring contains the largest number of dyes. Well, how do I know? Well, it is the one that goes up to give the largest number of spots, so obviously that is P. Please remember, it says explain and which. So you have to say which food coloring contains the largest number of dyes, that's P, explain. Many students forget to explain. This is because this is the one that has the largest number of spots. Question two says the diagram shows the apparatus used to prepare carbon dioxide in the laboratory. What is the name of the piece of apparatus containing the dilute hydrochloric acid? Well, what is this? Is this a burette? No, it's not a burette. You should know that a burette has a tap, but it also has graduations. This does not have graduations. Is it a pipette? Well, this is a pipette. A pipette is an accurate method of determining the volume or measuring the volume, but it doesn't have any graduations. It has only a mark. If I fill the pipette to that mark, it is exactly a certain volume, such as 25.0 centimeter cubed. Is it a tap funnel? 
you should remember that this that looks like a burat but no graduations and it has a tap this is called a dropping funnel or it can be referred to as a tap funnel so this is actually the tap funnel uh, is it a thistle funnel? No, the thistle funnel looks like this and it doesn't have a tap. So obviously the one we have in the diagram is a tap funnel or a dropping funnel. Complete the chemical equation for this reaction. This is carbonate plus acid, calcium carbonate plus acid. You should remember any carbonate plus acid will give what? Salt plus carbon dioxide plus water and then you have to balance how do we balance how many hydrogens before the arrow before the arrow I have one after the arrow I have two hydrogens so I need to put two in front of the HCl now I have two chlorines before the arrow and two chlorines after the arrow so this is balanced which of these is a true statement about carbon dioxide does it turn red litmus to blue which gas turns red litmus to blue you should remember red to blue means basic the only basic gas that we or alkaline gas that we talk about is ammonia carbon dioxide is not alkaline it is acidic so actually it would turn the blue to red does it turn lime water milky? Well, yes, that applies to carbon dioxide gas because we said lime water is actually calcium hydroxide, which is a base. So it can react with carbon dioxide, which is an acid. And what they form is calcium carbonate. And this does not dissolve in water. So actually the lime water turns milky due to the formation of calcium carbonate. Which gas relights a glowing splint? You should know, relighting a glowing splint, that is oxygen gas. Which gas burns with a squeaky pop? Remember, the one that uh, burns with a squeaky pop is hydrogen gas. The diagram shows how carbon dioxide is collected. And this is called downward delivery. When the tube, delivery tube goes down, this is called downward delivery. Now give a reason why carbon dioxide can be collected by downward delivery. Which type of gases are collected by downward delivery? If it is denser than air. So carbon dioxide is more dense or denser than air. So we collect it by downward delivery. What other method can we use to collect a gas? Remember, we should use a gas syringe. A gas syringe can be used for any gas and we use it if we need to determine the volume of the gas given off. What other methods can we use? Well, usually I can collect a gas over water. Can I do that for carbon dioxide? You should know that that's not a good idea for carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide dissolves in water. So normally we would not collect it over water which gases are collected by upward delivery you should remember that upward delivery we use for gases that are less dense than air for example ammonia if i tell you to collect ammonia we should collect it by upward delivery so anyway another method to collect carbon dioxide that would be using a gas sewage When carbon dioxide dissolves in water, a weakly acidic solution forms. So just a pH value for something that is weakly acidic. You should remember that when we dissolve carbon dioxide in water, it forms a, an acid called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid. Now what pH can we use for a weak acid? Remember weak acids um, will have a pH of about 4 or 5 or 6. They will turn universal indicator paper orange or yellow. So here this is a weak acid just like vinegar and lemon and ethanoic acid. Then the pH you can write either 4 or 5 or 6. 
Carbon dioxide also forms when copper carbonate is decomposed by heating. So if we heat copper carbonate, and this is called thermal decomposition, it breaks up into copper oxide plus carbon dioxide. State the change in color of the solid when copper carbonate decomposes. There are some colors that you are required to know. For example, what is the color of copper carbonate? You should know that copper carbonate is green. And when we heat it and it turns into copper oxide, copper oxide is black. So the color change here is from green to black. So just two properties of carbon dioxide that makes it suitable for use in fire extinguishers. Why do we use carbon dioxide in fire extinguishers? Of course, this is because, first of all, carbon dioxide is more dense than air. So if we spray it on the fire, it covers the fire, prevents any oxygen from reaching the fire. So the fire would go off. And also because this is a gas that does not burn. So these are the two properties that make it suitable for use in fire extinguishers. Question 3 says, a teacher investigates the reaction between sodium and water. The teacher fills a trough with water. She adds a few drops of litmus solution to the water and then adds a piece of sodium. The sodium floats on the water. It reacts with the water and produces bubbles of hydrogen gas. And we're asked to state two other observations that are made during the reaction. First of all, if I put sodium in water, what happens? You should realize that sodium is a reactive metal. It reacts with cold water. And when it reacts with cold water, it gives the metal hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. So put a metal from group 1 in cold water, it will give the metal hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. Well, what do we see? What are the observations? Please remember we need observations and that means something that we see. So don't tell me hydrogen gas is formed or sodium hydroxide is formed. That's not an observation. He already gives me some of the observations. The sodium floats on the water. Remember, all group 1 metals uh, have low density, so they are lower density than other metals, so they float on the surface of water. It reacts with water and produces bubbles of hydrogen gas. So bubbles of gas are already mentioned, so please do not write other observations, bubbles of gas or fizzing or effervescence all of these are the same bubbles fizzing effervescence are words that have the same meaning you do not write it if already the question mentions bubbles so i want two other observations what else would happen first of all the water in the beaker has litmus and you should know that when sodium hydroxide gas, uh, sodium hydroxide uh, solution is formed, this is an alkaline solution. So it would have an effect on the litmus, which you should know. And first of all, what other observations can we see? Of course, the piece of sodium that is floating will move around. First of all, darts on the surface of the water because of the bubbles pushing it around and it will become smaller or it will disappear because it is being used up or it is reacting. And of course, if sodium hydroxide forms in the solution, that means the litmus would turn blue. Balance the equation for the reaction between sodium and water. Well, okay, and he wants state symbols. So let us see, how do we balance? We have how many sodium before the arrow? One sodium before the arrow, one sodium after the arrow. How many hydrogens before the arrow? We have two hydrogens before the arrow, and we have one plus two, so we have three after the arrow. That means we need to increase the one that is less 
So I need to increase the coefficient in front of the water. So instead of one, which we don't write, I'm going to write two. But that means how many oxygens now do we have before the arrow? Remember that the two before the water applies to the hydrogen and to the oxygen. So now I have two oxygens before the arrow. So I need two oxygens after the arrow. But that ruined our sodium. Now we have two sodium after the arrow. So I need two sodium before the arrow. Now is it balanced? Yes, two sodium, two sodium. How many hydrogens before the arrow? I have two times two, which is four. And after the arrow, I have two in the sodium hydroxide and two in the H2. And two oxygens before the arrow, two oxygens after the arrow. Now we need state symbols. State symbols means I'm going to write S for solid, L for liquid, G for gas, and AQ for what? What does AQ mean? AQ means the uh, substance is dissolved in water or it is a solution. So sodium, sodium was a solid. A small piece of sodium is a solid. Water we say is a liquid. Sodium hydroxide is formed in water. So that is an aqueous solution. And of course, hydrogen is a gas. Lithium and potassium react in a similar way to sodium when added to water. State why they have a similar reaction in terms of electronic configurations of their atoms. You should know that all group one have similar reactions or similar chemical properties. All members of the same group have similar chemical properties because they all have the same number of electrons in outer shell. So if we say lithium, sodium, potassium have similar chemical properties, this is because they all have one electron in their outer shell. Place the elements lithium, potassium, sodium in order of reactivity. This is in group one. And you should remember that going down group one, the one down is the one that is more reactive. So potassium is more reactive than sodium, more reactive than lithium. And you should know why. So if the question says, why is this? Why is it that in group one, the one down is more reactive? Well, this is because the one down will have, as we go down the group, the one down, the outermost electron, you should remember a metal is more reactive if it has more tendency to lose that outermost electron. So which of these would lose the outermost electron more easily? Of course, it is the one at the bottom of the group. This is because the electron is further away from the nucleus. So there is less attraction forces between that outer electron and the positive nucleus. So the outer electron in potassium would be more easily lost. Please remember this explanation. If the question says explain why potassium is more reactive than lithium, for example. Use the periodic table on page two. Of course, in each of these exams, you have a periodic table on page two to help you answer this question. Which word correctly describes substances found in the periodic table? So everything in the periodic table, you should remember, periodic table is a table of what? It is a table of elements, not any of these other choices. The substances in the periodic table are arranged in order of increasing what? Remember, going from hydrogen to helium, then lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, and so on. These are arranged in order of increasing atomic number not mass number. We arrange them according to atomic number. The table lists properties of some of the gases in group zero of the periodic table. You should remember group zero, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and so on. Complete the table by giving the symbol for neon. You should know that the symbol for neon is NE. If you, remember, if you don't remember, just look at the periodic table. Boiling point, estimate the boiling point of argon. You look at the trend that is happening. As we go down, what's happening to the boiling point? It's increasing. Increasing by about how much? 
20 something. So what if we're going from four to 27 to how much? Well, any number between 40 and 100 would be given the grade. So estimate a number that is in between and keep in mind the uh, differences between one and the next. What about the reaction of xenon with metals? Obviously, all the elements in group zero do not react, so there is no reaction with metals. The photograph shows an electric light bulb. The tungsten filament becomes very hot when the light bulb is switched on. So just why argon is more suitable than air to use in the light bulb. Remember, uh, the use of argon is to fill light bulbs. Why do we use argon? Remember, there is a tungsten filament inside and I don't want the filament to burn. So we use argon, which is in group zero. So it has a full outer shell. It is unreactive. While if we have air in there or oxygen in there, that would cause the tungsten filament to burn. A student tries to make a pure dry sample of hydrated cobalt chloride crystals. He uses dilute hydrochloric acid and solid cobalt oxide. So this is a method of making salts and we're going to use, we're going to start with acid plus a solid insoluble solid. So this method is what we call neutralization method in which we're going to pour about 50 centimeter cubed of dilute hydrochloric acid into a beaker, warm the acid using a Bunsen burner, then add a small amount of the cobalt oxide and stir the mixture with a glass rod and keep adding further small amounts until it stops reacting. And then we filter to remove the excess cobalt oxide and as a residue and collect the filtrate leave the fil what he did was leave the filtrate until all of the water has evaporated which is actually not a good idea so the first question is his sample of cobalt oxide contains a small amount of solid impurity that dissolves in water but does not react with acid state why it is not necessary to have a precise measurement of the volume of hydrochloric acid in step one. So in step one, he says, pour about 50 centimeter cubed of dilute hydrochloric acid. And this is how we start this method of neutralization to prepare a salt. So we don't need it to be exactly 50.0, for example. Why? Because anyway, we're going to use excess cobalt oxide. So anyway, we're going to make sure that all the acid reacts. State why the acid is warmed. Why did he say warm the acid first? Remember, warm the acid using a Bunsen burner. This is to speed up the reaction or to increase the rate of the reaction or to make it faster. So just why a glass rod rather than a metal spatula is used to stir the mixture. When we stir any mixture, we usually use a glass rod not a spatula made of metal. This is because the metal reacts with acid, but the glass does not. State how the student will know when cobalt oxide stops reacting in step four. Well, we said we're going to keep adding until what? How do I know that it has stopped reacting? Remember, don't say no fizzing or no bubbles of gas. This is not a reaction that will give bubbles of gas. If I put cobalt oxide plus hydrochloric acid, this is cobalt chloride plus water. So this is not something that gives off a gas. So please don't say no more bubbles. But how do I know if the reaction has finished? If I add the cobalt oxide and it remains at the bottom of the beaker, so excess solid remains in the beaker, that means it's not reacting anymore. State why the method used in step six will not produce a pure sample of hydrated cobalt chloride. What did he do in step six? He said, leave the filtrate until all of the water has evaporated. 
that's not how we do it. When we filter and we take the filtrate and I want to change it into crystals, I should do a crystallization. I do not leave it until all the water has evaporated because if I do that, then any soluble impurities would remain with the cobalt chloride crystals. I want only the cobalt chloride to form crystals and be collected. If I just leave the water to evaporate, then any soluble impurities would also remain with the cobalt chloride. So describe how the student should have done this, how the student could produce pure dry sample of crystals from the filtrate in step five. So I shouldn't leave it to evaporate, I should do what? Do crystallization. So you're explaining how to do crystallization. Heat the filtrate to point of crystallization, cool to form crystals, then we filter the crystals, wash the crystals with a few drops of distilled water, and dry between filtered papers. This is how we get crystals from a solution. Okay? The table shows the formula and color of three different types of cobalt chloride. When water is added very slowly to solid cobalt chloride, the color changes from blue to purple to pink. Write a chemical equation for the change from purple to pink. Well, he already gives me the formula of each of them. So the purple is cobalt chloride to water. Remember when we say COCl2 dot 2H2O, we are writing the formula of a hydrated salt that has water in its crystals. And we call that the water of crystallization. So this is a hydrated salt with water of crystallization. Now I need to add more water to change it into cobalt chloride 6 water. And that means we balance that with 4H2O. Which of these words describes the change taking place when pink is pink solid is heated to form blue solid? Remember, this is cobalt chloride, and we use the cobalt chloride to test for water. The pink one, if you don't remember, it was already mentioned in the table that the pink one is the one that has six water. So cobalt chloride with six water, which is hydrated cobalt chloride, is pink. Now, what do we do to change it into blue? To change it into blue, which is the anhydrous cobalt chloride, that means cobalt chloride that doesn't have any water in it, well, I have to heat it to remove the water. Removal of water is called dehydration. Tests are done on a sample of solid X. Solid X contains ammonium, NH4+, one other cation and one anion. The table lists details of the test done on solid X and the observations made for each test. So the first question says add dilute sodium hydroxide and warm. Of course, when we add dilute sodium hydroxide and warm, this is a test for what? This is a test for the ammonium ion, which he said is present. So when I add dilute sodium hydroxide and warm, on an ammonium salt, there is a gas given off and the gas turns damp litmus paper from red to blue. And the question down there says, identify the gas given off in test one, which gas changes that damp litmus paper from red to blue? You should know that this is ammonia gas and you should know that if I have an ammonium salt, I add a base it will give off ammonia gas. Give the formula of the other cation present. Well, what did they do? They did flame test and it gave lilac flame. You should remember the colors of the flame test. Which of these gives a lilac flame? You should remember that that is potassium. But don't write potassium. He's not asking for the name of the cation. He's asking for what? give the formula. And remember, these flame tests are tests for the cations. So it's not potassium K, no, it is potassium ion, so it is K plus. That is the formula of the cation that would give a lilac colored flame. 
State what test 3A and 3B tell you. What was 3A and 3B? These were the tests. He said a sample of solid X is dissolved in deionized water. Remember deionized water or distilled water or just pure water. The solution is divided into three test tubes and the following tests are done. So the, to the first test tube, they added a, a, a dilute hydrochloric acid. The first thing you're going to ask yourself, dilute hydrochloric acid is test for what? You should know that hydrochloric acid, when I add it to a substance, this is test for carbonate. And if I have carbonate, I should get bubbles of gas that turn lime water milky. Now, when he added dilute hydrochloric acid, he got no change. And that means there is no carbonate. To the second test tube, add dilute nitric acid and a few drops of silver nitrate solution. Again, this is test for what? Well, you should know this is test for the halides, chloride, bromide, iodide. Now, when I add dilute nitric acid and silver nitrate, if I have chloride, I should get white precipitate, bromide, cream precipitate, iodide, yellow precipitate. They got no change and that means I don't have any of these. So my conclusion is no halide or no chloride, bromide, iodide. Remember we're talking about chloride, bromide, iodide, not chlorine. Don't say no chlorine. It's not chlorine, it's chloride. So it is something chloride, sodium chloride, potassium chloride and so on. Identify the anion in solid X. Well, the last test that they did to the third test tube, add dilute hydrochloric acid and barium chloride, and they got white precipitate. Again, this is test for what? If I add hydrochloric acid and barium chloride, or we say nitric acid and barium nitrate, barium something with acid, if I get a white precipitate, this is test for sulfate. So this tells me that the substance contains sulfate ions. Question 7 says, antimony is an element in group 5 of the periodic table. The mineral contains antimony sulfide. Antimony can be obtained from this in a two-stage process. So we're starting with antimony sulfide. It is roasted in air to give the oxide plus sulfur dioxide. And then the oxide produces heated with carbon to form antimony. State why sulfur in stage one is said to be oxidized. Well, let's look at the equation. Well, where is sulfur? Sulfur was in the antimony sulfide and it changed into SO2. And that means the sulfur gained oxygen so we say it is oxidized. Complete the equation. So basically we're trying to balance. Again, how many antimony? Antimony is the SB. Before the arrow, I have two. So after the arrow, I need two. How many oxygens before the arrow? I have four. So I need two here so that two times two is four. But that means now I have two carbons. So I need two carbons. So this is the balancing of the equation. Bismuth is another element in group 5 of the periodic table. Bismuth forms an oxide Bi2O3, which has a giant ionic structure. Of course, we said before, when we were talking about periodic table, that groups 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, these are non-metals. But there are exceptions. So bismuth is an exception. When it forms an oxide, it forms an ionic structure. Give the formula of the bismuth ion in bismuth oxide. Of course, from the formula given, you can see that the valency of bismuth is what? Remember, the valency of one goes under the other one. So actually, the valency of bismuth is three, so it should be three positives. The first one is positive, the second one is negative. So this is bismuth three plus. Explain why bismuth oxide has a high melting point. 
Well, the question mentions that this is ionic, and that means it will be in the form of a giant crystal lattice. So ionic compounds have high melting point because strong electrostatic attraction forces between what? Between positive and negative ions, or we can say oppositely charged ions in the giant three-dimensional crystal lattice that need a large amount of energy to be broken. Bismuth oxide reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid to form bismuth chloride. Write a chemical equation for this reaction. So, we are already given the formula for bismuth oxide. So that is Bi2O3, and we're acting it with hydrochloric acid, HCl. Now, what should it give? First of all, it should give bismuth chloride, and we're already told that the valency of bismuth is 3, so it should be BiCl3. Plus what? Remember that oxide plus acid, base plus acid, gives salt plus water. And then we balance. Please do not leave the equation without balancing. How many bismuth before the arrow? We have two bismuth after the arrow. How many oxygens before the arrow? We have three oxygens, so we need three after the arrow. And that means that I have six hydrogens and six chlorines after the arrow, so I need six in front of the HCl. Question 8 says, a student investigates the rate of reaction between zinc and hydrochloric acid using an excess of zinc powder. The student measures the volume of gas in the syringe every minute for 10 minutes, and we're given the table. Plot the student's results and draw a curve of best fit. Again, we're reminding you, Plotting means we put it in small x's or a dot with a circle. And then we join so that if there is one point away from the curve, we do not include it. The curve cannot go out and then back in. So it has to be like this. And the point that's away from the curve is what we call an anomalous result in which something went wrong with the experiment and the student got a wrong result. The result at two minutes is anomalous. That gives you a hint that you shouldn't include it in the curve. So just a mistake that the student could have made to produce this anomalous result. Well, we take a look. What was the student doing? We were measuring the volume of gas every every what? Every minute for 10 minutes. Well, what could have gone wrong? Either the student was reading the volume for that uh, reading wrong, there was a wrong reading of the volume in the syringe, or the student did not take it after a minute. Maybe the student waited for a longer time, and that is why uh, they got a higher volume than what they should get. Well, use your graph to estimate the volume that should be given at two minutes. So at two minutes, I go up and I show clearly on the graph. So I draw a line going up from two minutes to the curve and then horizontal to the volume. What is the volume from the graph? It is 27 centimeter cubed. Please do not forget to show on your graph how you obtained your answer. Explain why the last four readings for the volume of gas are the same. Well, Usually, we start very fast, and then the reaction slows down, and then at the end, no more gas is given. Remember, we go back and we see which one was excess. Well, we're reacting zinc with hydrochloric acid, and the zinc was excess. So at the end of the experiment, we ran out of what? So all the acid was used up. Please don't say all the reactants were used up. You look for which one is excess, then the other one is the one that was used up. So no more collisions, the reaction finished, no more gas is given off. State how the graph shows that the rate of reaction decreases. Why do we say that it starts off very fast, and this applies to any reaction. Any reaction starts off very fast and then it slows down. It slows down 
from the curve, we can see that the slope of the curve decreases because the question says state how the graph shows that the rate of reaction decreases. So it is because the slope of the curve decreases. Explain in terms of the particle collision theory why the rate decreases during the first seven minutes. You should remember that as the reaction proceeds, particles are being used up. So less collisions per second. Please mention time in that. So less frequent collisions or less collisions per second. This apparatus is used to test whether magnesium, solid magnesium chloride and aqueous solution of magnesium chloride conduct electricity. The table shows the results now, what they did was they connected each of these substances to that electric circuit. How do we know if the substance conducts electricity? Well, if the lamp turns on. So, magnesium, they found, conducts electricity. Of course, that's a metal. Solid magnesium chloride does not, but the aqueous solution does. Explain these results with reference to the type of particles in each substance. Well, we should know magnesium is a metal. It has free-moving, delocalized electrons. So the movement of the electrons will allow um, metal as a solid to conduct electricity. Now, solid magnesium chloride has positive and negative ions that are fixed in a crystal lattice structure. So as a solid, Ionic compounds do not conduct electricity because the positive and negative ions are not free to move. But if I dissolve it in solution, then the positive and negative ions are free to move. And that is why ionic compounds conduct electricity only when molten or in solution. Bromine is a red-brown liquid at room temperature. Liquid bromine forms a bromine gas when warmed. Explain what happens to the bromine molecules when liquid bromine is warmed to form a gas. Remember, we can change between solids, liquids, and gases. If we heat a liquid, it becomes a gas, and that is evaporation, or we could say it is boiling. Um, what happens when a liquid is heated to form a gas? You should know molecules gain kinetic energy, move faster, overcome the attraction forces between them, and move further apart. So going from solid to liquid to gas, we need to give it heat. So these processes are endothermic. Going the other way, gas, liquid, solid, this gives out heat, so this is an exothermic process. Bromine reacts with water to form a mixture of hydrobromic acid and hypobromous acid. Write a chemical equation. So we're given everything. All we need to know is that bromine is diatomic. When it's standing alone, it has to be Br2. Please remember which ones are diatomic. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and everything under fluorine are diatomic. So they need a two. The diatomic means the molecule is made up of two atoms. So it has to be Br2. Please do not write things like Br or N or O or H standing alone. Plus water, we already have the formulas of the products. And the next thing would be, is it balanced or does it need balancing? Well, let's look. Two bromines before the arrow. Well, we have a total of two bromines after the arrow. Two hydrogens before the arrow, two hydrogens after the arrow. One oxygen, one oxygen. So it is already balanced. Hydrobromic acid reacts with magnesium carbonate to form a solution containing magnesium bromide. Crystals of hydrated magnesium bromide can be obtained from this solution. An excess of hydrobromic acid is reacted with 0.125 mole of magnesium carbonate. Show by calculation that the maximum mass of hydrated magnesium bromide that can be made is 36.5. So we are given the equation. 
we're given that we're starting with 0.125 mole of magnesium carbonate and we're being asked to determine the mass of what? The mass of magnesium bromide. Okay, looking at the equation, the first thing we do, we already have number of moles of magnesium carbonate. So we look at the equation, compare the number of moles, and we will find that from the equation, number of moles of magnesium carbonate should be the same as uh, magnesium bromide. So the number of moles of magnesium bromide is the same. And that means I can get mass from the equation that says number of moles is mass over molecular mass. So the mass is number of moles times the molecular mass we are given. Please check in the question whether we're given the MR or not. We are given, so we don't need to sit down and calculate it. Remember, all of these exams are time limited. So we find from this that the mass of magnesium bromide that we should get, which we call the theoretical mass, is 36.5 grams. In an experiment using 0.125 mole of magnesium carbonate with excess of hydrobromic acid, the mass of the hydrated magnesium bromide obtained is 26. So this is less than what we calculated. Now, suggest so two reasons why the actual mass is less than the maximum mass that we calculated. Usually, when we do these experiments in the lab, we get less than what we should get. This is because I could be starting with something that's not pure. So maybe the magnesium carbonate was not pure. So actually, the number of moles calculated is not correct. Or not all the magnesium carbonate reacted or some of the product was lost during the experiment when I'm doing crystallization or doing filtration. So these are the usual reasons why uh, what we obtain as a mass at the end of the experiment is usually less than what we should get. Malachite is an ore of copper containing copper carbonate and several other compounds that are insoluble in water. So I have a mixture of copper carbonate and impurities that do not dissolve in water. You are supplied with several pieces of malachite, these chemicals and items of apparatus. So we have dilute sulfuric acid, magnesium powder, and we have the apparatus needed. Describe how you would use the chemicals and the apparatus to obtain a sample of copper from the malachite. So we're starting with malachite, which is pieces of copper carbonate plus other compounds that are not soluble. So the first thing we should do is what? We should crush the malachite in a mortar and pestle, then put it into a beaker and add the acid. So we are adding excess sulfuric acid to make sure that the malachite uh, reacts. Stir with a glass rod. Remember to mention apparatus as you go along. Then we will have insoluble impurities left. So we need to filter and we get the filtrate. So when we react copper carbonate with sulfuric acid, what we get is copper sulfate. Now, if we add magnesium to copper sulfate, you should realize that magnesium is more reactive than copper. So it would displace the copper and I will end up with copper metal depositing. So I filter that through filter paper and funnel to obtain the copper as a residue. Please explain this in detail in the correct order. Crude oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons, fractional distillation of crude oil and cracking of hydrocarbon fractions are two of the processes used in an oil refinery. So this is how we obtain organic compounds from petroleum or crude oil. So the first thing is the crude oil is heated and vaporized and then it goes up into the fractionating column where it is uh, cooled and condensed at different what? Which property of hydrocarbons is used to separate the crude oil into fractions? Of course, we heat it until 
it vaporizes and then we leave it to cool so we are separating it depending on difference in boiling point you remember the ones that have lower boiling point less number of carbons are collected at the top these are the main fractions obtained from crude oil. So we have butamine, diesel, fuel oil, gasoline, kerosene, refinery gases. Give one use for refinery gases. Remember, you're required to know the order in which these come out from the fractionating column and the use of each one. So what do we use refinery gases for? It is used for bottled gas, for heating and cooking. Give one use of kerosene. Where is kerosene? Kerosene is used as fuel for jets. Don't just say for jets. It is fuel for jets. State which fraction is the most viscous. Viscous means it is a very thick liquid. Remember, as we go down the fractionating column, the fractions become higher boiling point, more number of carbons, more viscous so the one at the bottom is the one that is the most viscous catalytic cracking is used to break down long chain alkanes into shorter chain alkanes and alkenes name the catalyst and state the temperature used in industrial cracking you should remember if we say what is cracking it is the breakdown of long chain hydrocarbons into shorter chains now we need catalyst and heat which catalyst? Aluminium oxide catalyst, or we refer to it as alumina. Temperature is 600 to 700 degrees Celsius. Tetradecane can be cracked to make ethene and only one other hydrocarbon. Write a chemical equation for this reaction. Remember, cracking can give either alkane plus alkene or alkene plus hydrogen so here we're told that it will give ethene which is c2h4 plus one other compound of course the rest is the rest of the carbon and the rest of the hydrogen so if i'm starting with c14h30 i remove c2h4 so i'm left with the other hydrocarbon has to be C12H26. That's the rest of the carbon and the rest of the hydrogen. Draw the displayed formula of ethene. How do we draw ethene? Remember, F means two carbons. E means I have a double bond between them, and each carbon must have a total of four bonds. So we have two hydrogens for each carbon. Name the polymer formed from ethene. If I want to draw the polymer of ethene, we said the double bond becomes single and we draw a bond on the right and the bond on the left and we include the hydrogens that were already there. How do we name a polymer? It is poly, the same name that we started with. So this is polymer made from ethene. So this is called polyethene. Explain why this polymer is difficult to dispose of. So why is it difficult to throw away polymers? You should know that polymers are inert. They are non-biodegradable, so they accumulate in dump sites. We don't need to mention the fact that when it burns, it releases toxic gases because we're not talking about burning. We're talking about disposing of it, throwing it away. So the problem is they are inert, non-biodegradable, so they would accumulate in dump sites. A student investigates the reaction between zinc and dilute sulfuric acid. She uses this method. Put 50 centimeter cubed of dilute sulfuric acid into a polystyrene cup. What's a polystyrene cup? You should realize that when we're doing any experiment, that involves measurement of temperature, we should do it in a polystyrene cup, not in a glass beaker. This is because the polystyrene is an insulator, so there will be less loss of heat to the environment. So we put the 50 centimeter cubed of dilute sulfuric into a polystyrene cup. 
measure the initial temperature of the acid at two grams of zinc and stair measure the temperature after one minute the student does the experiment three times for each experiment she uses the same size pieces of zinc but she's changing what different concentrations of sulfuric acid so these are the results and we're required to record the temperature in the table calculate the temperature increase for each experiment and remember give all values to the nearest 0.5 degrees celsius so let us read the thermometers you should be able to read all of this so in experiment one the initial is 16 point zero we want it to one decimal the uh, after one minute it is 19 point zero so the difference is three point zero uh, in experiment two the initial also is 16 21 so a difference of five uh, 16 27 point five so it's a difference of 11 point five Please note you should record all of them to one decimal place. Explain why the temperature increase changes as the co concentration of sulfuric acid increases. What was the difference between these experiments? Experiment 1 was using 1 mole per decimeter cubed of the acid. Experiment 2 was a higher concentration and experiment 3 was a higher concentration. So obviously as we increase the concentration there was a higher temperature rise and this is because this is an exothermic reaction since the temperature went up exothermic reactions give out heat they give out heat to what they give out heat to the surrounding solution so the temperature of the surrounding solution increases so why is it that the temperature increases with increasing concentration? Of course, if I have higher concentration, then more particles collide at the same time. So the rate of the reaction increases, more heat is transferred or the heat that is transferred would be transferred to the solution more quickly. So within one minute, there would be a higher temperature rise. The student does another experiment at the same initial temperature as experiment three. She uses the same size pieces of zinc, but uses 25 centimeter cubed of dilute sulfuric acid. Remember the first one, the, uh, she was putting 50 centimeter cubed. So now we're using a smaller volume of acid. The acid is excess in both reactions. So we, we shouldn't say we should get less product or uh, something but what we're doing is we have lower volume less volume of acid now explain the effect if any of this change on the initial rate of course if the acid anyway is excess there should be no effect on the rate since the temperature is the same the surface area is the same and the acid already is in excess so whether i use 25 or 50 does not make a difference now explain the effect if any of this change on the temperature increase so there is no effect on the rate but what about the temperature increase well if i use the same temperature rise to heat a smaller volume then there will be a greater temperature rise so there is a greater temperature rise for the smaller volume because the same amount of energy that is released from the experiment is used to heat up a smaller volume of solution iron deficiency anemia occurs when the body does not have enough iron too iron deficiency can be overcome by taking iron tablets a chemist wants to find out the percentage of iron 2 in an iron tablet. She uses this method, weigh an iron tablet, dissolve the tablet in excess dilute uh, sulfuric acid, titrate the solution with potassium permanganate. And the first question is calculate the number of moles of KMnO4 
in this volume and this concentration of the solution. So we have volume and concentration and we want to get number of moles. How do we get number of moles? You should know number of moles is concentration times volume. And remember the volume has to be in decimeter cubed. So if we're given the volume in centimeter cubed, I divide that by a thousand and then I multiply it with the concentration, I get the number of moles. Now, in the titration, one mole of KMnO4 reacts with five moles of iron 2. So if I have this number of moles that I calculated for potassium permanganate, calculate the amount in moles of iron 2. We're saying one mole reacts with five. So this number of moles times five would be the number of moles of iron 2 that would react. Calculate the mass of iron 2. How do we calculate mass? Mass is number of moles times MR. We calculated the number of moles and we are given the MR. So this is the mass of iron 2. Now calculate the percentage of iron 2 in the tablet. Well, we are given the mass of the tablet was 0.298. We calculated the mass of iron 2. So the percent would be the mass of iron 2 over the mass of the tablet times 100. So this tells us that the tablet had 32.7% of iron 2. A teacher uses this apparatus to demonstrate electrolysis of molten zinc chloride. A student records these observations. Crystals of shiny gray solid form at one of the electrodes pale green substance forms at the other electrode, the lamp goes out after the teacher stops heating. First of all, state what is meant by electrolysis. You should know definitions. Electrolysis is breakdown of a compound using electricity. Now, state why graphite is more suitable to use for electrodes than magnesium in this electrolysis. We said usually the electrodes are made of graphite and this is because graphite is inert. Of course it conducts electricity but magnesium also would conduct electricity. So we're using graphite because it's inert while magnesium is a reactive metal that would react with zinc chloride. Then, which of these is a correct statement for this electrolysis? So, let's see. What was the electrolysis? He was doing electrolysis of... These are the observations that he had. And he was doing electrolysis of molten zinc chloride. So, one observation was crystals of shiny gray solid form and pale green substance form and the lamp goes out after the teacher stops heating, what is happening? Remember, molten zinc chloride, if I do electrolysis, then the chlorine is formed at the positive. Remember, chloride ions are negative ions. They go to the positive electrode to form chlorine, and chlorine is a pale green gas. So when he says a pale green gas is formed, that was a correct observation. Negative electrode, we have the zinc ions, which are positive, will go to the negative and form a shiny gray solid. So which of these um, choices are correct? The first choice says the pale green substance is chloride. No. Remember, the pale green substance is chlorine. Remember, in the molten zinc chloride, the ions are chloride ions that go to the positive. But when they go to the positive, they lose electrons and become chlorine. So the pale green substance that is formed is actually chlorine. Both products are elements. That one is correct. Chlorine and zinc are elements. What about the rest? The pale green substance forms at the negative electrode? No, the pale green substance is the chlorine, which is formed from chloride ions that are negative, so it is formed at the positive. The shiny gray solid that is formed is zinc chloride? No, it is zinc. 
not zinc chloride so my answer is b the student writes this ionic half equation for the reaction that forms the pale green substance so we started with chloride and it is supposed to give chlorine you should know that chlorine is diatomic it has to be written cl2 not 2cl and then the chloride ions are negative they lose electrons so i can either write it like this or like this the chloride ions lose electrons not plus electrons so the two mistakes are electrons are lost from the chloride not gained and the cl2 is formed not to cl chlorine is diatomic the molecule is made up of two chlorine atoms the lamp goes out after the teacher stops heating because electrons are no longer flowing through the wires explain why electrons are no longer flowing through the wires so we're talking about the wires outside we know that the wires are made up of copper for example and that's a metal and there should be electrons that are flowing in the external circuit or in the wires but it would not float if there are no electrons that are lost or gained so if it is heated the zinc chloride becomes solid and you know that solid ionic compounds do not conduct electricity so we don't have any ions free to move to lose or gain electrons at the electrodes so there is no electric current passing through so electrons are no longer flowing through the wires and that was the last question um, i hope this was useful to you uh, thank you for listening and please keep liking and uh, share the video with your friends